Good morning, everyone. Okay, let's uh, pray and get started with this morning's class. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, the special time that you've given us to uh, study the Book of Acts. Help us, O oh God, with your wisdom. Uh, and the leading of your Holy Spirit, Father, that uh, uh, we can learn lessons and, Lord, that we can build our lives, uh, Father God, on the Word of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we were in Acts chapter 9 and we saw how uh, Paul or Saul, the persecutor, had an encounter with the living God and how Jesus asks him as to why he's persecuting Jesus. And then we saw he, when he encountered uh, God and uh, <coughs> understood that it was God speaking to him, he went blind. He was led to a place in Damascus. He was staying there for three days without food or water. And God gave a vision to a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias, he comes and uh, he prays for uh, Saul and Saul receives his sight. Not only that, Saul is also baptized. Okay, so this much we, we understood and uh, we were about to read further from there. So as soon as Saul was baptized, and uh, it's quite clear now that he has become a believer. Now, what are the things that take place? We can look at uh, Acts chapter 9 from verse 20. We can read on. Can somebody read, please, from verse 20 to 22? Immediately he preached the Christ in synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. But Saul increased all the more in his strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jews, Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Yes. So it's interesting that Saul, the persecutor, has now become the persecuted. Till now, he was the one who was trying to kill people for their faith. What were the Christians called as? There was a word which we used last, last week. What were, what were they collected? The way. As? The way. Right. Thank you, Tina. They were known as the way. Okay. Uh, and right now, he has become a part of the way. See his passion. He's just healed and he is baptized. He immediately wants to preach Christ. So in verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues. He was a very learned man. We know he is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he had knowledge of the scriptures. So all the more he would have understood why Jesus is the Messiah based on the scriptures. So he's he's excited. He wants to go and preach Christ in the synagogues. He goes ahead and he does it. Because it is so immediate, people were not able to accept a persecutor preaching Christ. It says they were amazed. And they asked the question, is it not the same person who was persecuting, who is preaching now? But Saul went on. He went on preaching. He was able to uh, explain about Jesus to the Jews. But what happened is people began to plot against him, to kill him. Right. So from verse 23, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So he's the one who has become the persecuted. In verse 25, then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. This is wisdom applied by the disciples in Damascus. They realize if this goes on, 
they'll kill Saul. We can't let it happen. So let's do something for him. And what they do is they release him out of the city. How? They put him in a large basket and get him to escape out of the city. So now he's out of Damascus. Okay. After Damascus, now what exactly happens? We have to understand the chronology of events that took place as far as the ministry of Saul is concerned. Ministry in Damascus was immediate, but not accepted. He escaped. Where did he go after that? It's a little bit tough to paint the picture from Acts 9 itself because it does not give us the chronology. We have to go to the book of Galatians to understand what exactly happened. Okay, So we recognize that Paul left Damascus through the city wall and he had to go into uh, the regions of Arabia. And uh, one second. There is the city wall picture. If you all have the notes, you could probably click on the notes and see it yourselves. OK, let me see if I can share the screen with you. It's also there in the notes, which has already been posted. But just for your convenience, let me quickly share it. Yeah, I think you can see it now. So there are certain images here from a link on the web. So Damascus, there's a picture of Damascus. Uh, sorry, I can't make it bigger than what it is right here. And then you can see uh, the, you know, more recent picture, and then you have the house of Ananias. Okay, back in those days, remember the house of Ananias, uh, how God told him the exact address go to the streets straight, and over there, there was the house of Ananias. So, there is a picture of that, and then, of course, is the wall, the city wall. So, from the wall, they put him in a basket and they let them down. That's how he escaped. So now he is out of this place. All right. Now we can proceed. Yeah. So he's let out from there. And once he was let out of that place, we were asking the question, where did he go? Okay, Because immediately, if you look at the text here in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it says, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem. So after Damascus, did Saul come to Jerusalem? That's the question we are asking. But I have stated that Something is missing here between verse 25 and 26, which Luke wrote. Three years of Paul's life is not recorded. Okay, so after Damascus, where did he go? When we go to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 19, we can also focus in on verse 18 there. Paul wrote, Uh, let's read from 17. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So notice, he's very clearly stating over there saying, he did not go immediately to Jerusalem. So how many years is there between verse 25 and 26? Three years, three years. So where was he in the three years? He was, he left Damascus, went to Arabia, went back to Damascus, then went to Jerusalem. Okay, so Arabia, Damascus, that's where he is. What are the activities which he was doing over there? 
if you read that passage from Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 19, it's quite clear that he was continuing to share, continuing to teach, continuing to do the work of the ministry the way he knew it and talk about Jesus Christ. So that is what he did over there uh, for all these years. And did he go through persecution? Yes, he went through persecution. Anyhow, we came to verse uh, 25 where we now are seeing that he's going to Jerusalem. So, verse, sorry, verse 26. So in verse 26, it starts, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So it's been three years. Why do you think the apostles are not ready or the disciples are not ready to accept him? Yeah, so his reputation was so bad as a persecutor that even after three years of doing ministry, he's not being accepted. So it was tough for Saul. He's a believer. He's doing the work wherever he's sent, but he's not yet coming into the fullness of the call of God on his life. We could put it like that, right? The disciples are not ready to accept him in Jerusalem. So what did he do in Jerusalem? Again, this part is missing in Acts 9. We have to read Galatians only. Galatians 1 verses 25, 21 to 24. If we read that part, there we will understand that uh, he went to regions of Syria and Cilicia and, uh, uh, you know, he was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, verse 23, but they were hearing only he was he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So his ministry was continuing in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Okay, so he goes up to Jerusalem. Over there, he is not accepted. So he is continuing the ministry in Syria and Cilicia. So finally, finally, when you look at uh, uh, you know this this passage here, okay, what we'll do is we'll probably read it so that there is clarity. Could someone read from verse twenty six? We have made it very clear between verse twenty five and twenty six. Three years are there. Where was Paul? Arabia. Damascus. Okay, now let's read 26. And when Paul had come to Jerusalem, yes. he tried to join the dis uh, disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. What? You can continue till verse 30. But Barnabas took him and huh. brought him to the to the to the apostle. Yes. And he declared to them, now he had seen the Lord on the road, and okay. that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Yes. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming yes. in and going out. Yes. And he spoken boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenist. Yes. But they attempt to kill him. Yes. When the brethren found out, they brought him down and Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Tarsus. Okay. Tarsus. Very, very nice. So three years, Damascus, Arabia. Then who brings him to who introduces him to the uh, apostles in Jerusalem? Barnabas. Okay, Barnabas uh, introduces there and we we are able to kind of uh, track and understand that he spent a very short time in Jerusalem. So likely that he spent only 15 days in Jerusalem and he met with uh, Peter and James. Only 15 days. So again, think about this. He was not with the apostles for a very long time. The apostles were with Jesus and then they were together with each other. But Paul did not have that opportunity. Only 15 days he got with Peter and James. Okay. And 
when he is in jerusalem he is trying to preach the gospel he is not accepted first of all by the disciples secondly by the jews he is uh, argue like you you know he is disputing with them uh, on the matter of jesus and people are trying to kill him once again so finally he is now sent to the regions of just now uh, chira red tarsus so arabia damascus 3 years 15 days jerusalem after jerusalem tarsus tarsus and cilicia what do we know about cilicia have you ever heard this name cilicia before yeah he belonged there he belonged Correct. to that place yes you remember yes. we when we saw stephen stoning in uh, act 7 uh, there were some people from the synagogues of cilicia it says there so saul was one of them consenting to the uh, death of stephen so cilicia is saul's place that's his you could say hometown saul of tarsus that region cilicia region okay so uh, that is what we understand so he went back to his own region and he started doing the work of the ministry there so he was ministering you know in that particular region how long did he minister now again as we try to calculate the amount of time that was spent uh, some historians say nearly 10 years he was ministering in these regions of uh, tarsus and cilicia so think about it he got born again 3 years plus 10 years 13 years right 13 years uh, and not even the apostles are ready to kind of you know accept him so yeah maybe they accepted but once he started preaching in jerusalem he's having trouble so you remember just yesterday in the mentoring our pastor was also sharing about how preparation god season of preparation in people's lives so apostle paul went through his own season of preparation though he is a mighty apostle things did not take place immediately in his life he also was in obscurity or he was hidden but in those times what was required god always wants to see our faithfulness and thank god you know he was faithful and he continued to do the work of god it's only later on in acts chapter 11 we will see pa- barnabas will go he will he will bring saul and they both will start to do ministry in the gentile church of antioch okay antioch of syria but till that time Paul is nowhere in the picture, and we are going to continue now with you know chapter nine and uh, chapter ten without the mention of Paul. So Paul is going through his own season of preparation. That's how we understand it. So roughly fourteen years uh, from the time of him being born again to the time that Barnabas brings him back to minister in uh, Antioch. Now let's continue the. focus is shifting out now so you're not going to be reading about paul but we're going to read about the ministry of peter so from verse 31 it says in this time when all of these things were going on the churches throughout all judea galilee and samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy spirit they were multiplied so we read earlier the beginning of acts chapter 9 great persecution isn't it acts chapter 9 acts chapter 8 great persecution was taking place but seems like there was a season of peace and little bit of the persecution may have come down in that time the churches were thriving so they uh, listed out there judea galilee and samaria had peace and were edified edified means strengthened and they continued to grow in the lord they had the work of the holy spirit manifest in them and they also grew they multiplied 
okay so that's a great thing for us to understand so as uh, you know god encountered saul we mustn't forget the background of the churches the churches are still there believing people are still there god is continuing to increase his work throughout the region now let's focus in on the ministry of peter starting here at verse 32 we will find ministry of peter up until the end of acts chapter 11 so what are all some of the things that took place so there is a healing of a man by the name of uh, anias can someone read it out from verse 32 to 35 now it came to pass as peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in uh, Lydda, Lydia. There he found a there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sarun saw him and turned to the Lord. Oh, praise God. So there is a supernatural miracle. There's a man, Aeneas, uh, eight years, he is bedridden and paralyzed. Peter ministers supernatural healing to him. He says, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Did we see this kind of a command anywhere else? Arise, take up your bed. Yeah, even in the ministry of Jesus. How do you think they gave these commands? Are we supposed to say it every time? Take up, arise, take up your bed. How to issue these commands? Any thoughts, online students? Or should we say it all the time? If you see anyone who's bedridden, he said, take up your bed. Maybe it was wo word of knowledge for that particular situation. That OK. Uh, would... yes. yes, thank you, Nina. It was a word of knowledge for that particular situation. Yes, Jira? If we have the authority given on Jesus, I guess we can say every time, if there is anyone sick, because God already gave us authority. So in that authority, if we we'll walk, then it's ours. We can command, I guess. Yeah, it's true that we have the authority over sicknesses, diseases, and sorry, uh, any health condition, we can exercise our authority. But the commands that we issue, uh, as Nina said, we should hear from the Holy Spirit. Because every time it could be something different. Isn't it? Jesus also, there was no formula. Sometimes he says, be healed. Sometimes he says, you know, stretch forth your hand. Uh, sometimes he says, go and show yourself to the priest. Sometimes he says, no, you go and wash your eyes in the pool of silver. It was different. But how was Jesus doing it? He said, I only do what I see the Father do. So he was speaking what he heard the father say to him. So same way, when we are praying for someone, how should we minister? Depend on the Holy Spirit. We may be praying for the person and Holy Spirit may say, lay your hands and pray. Holy Spirit may say, anoint with oil. So if we are sensing it, we can say, okay, brother, do you have any oil? I want to pray with oil over you. So don't do it as a formula. Every time, yeah, we are going to say, take up your bed and walk. It doesn't work like that. Unless, as Nina said, word of knowledge. Holy Spirit is showing us, you minister like this. We may tell one person, brother, okay, you get up. Brother, you move your hands, you move your feet. As led by the Holy Spirit is the key to ministering healing. So in this case, uh, you know, Peter may have sensed by the Holy Spirit, that he should 
ask this paralyzed person to take up their bed. So that's why he said it. And was he healed? How how soon? Wow, amazing. Okay. So the supernatural, the miraculous is taking place. It's not stopped. We saw in Acts 3. Again, it's happening. Nothing has stopped. They are, they're going, they're preaching the gospel, but there are signs, wonders, healings, miracles taking place continuously. So praise God. You know, that region of Lydda and Sharon, this uh, uh, wonderful miracle took place. Now, there's another place called Jopa. And there is a crisis in Jopa. So what is that? Let's quickly read it. Could uh, someone read till verse 39, 36 to 39? At Jopa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. Yes. Which is translated Dorkas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. Yes. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood up, stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorsus had made while she was she was with them. Okay. Anyway, so it goes on later on. Uh, but Peter, he stops them from crying. Uh, he kneels down. He prays for this uh, this girl, Dorcas, and he says, Tabitha, arise. And she opens up her eyes, and she saw Peter and sat up. Okay, And uh, he lifts her up, and he presents her alive to the people. And throughout Jopa, many people believed. And, uh, uh, you know, Peter stayed there also for some time in the house of Simon the Tanner. Now, what I want us to think about is, in Sharon and Lydda, he was doing the ministry and one person got uh, healed. Now, if you and I were there, okay, it's like saying we are uh, in a, a particular place and not too far away, people heard that we came. So think about this. You know, Peter is tired. He's doing the ministry. He may have thought, okay, this man Anias got healed. Praise the Lord. You know, we are going to take rest now. But suddenly the news comes. More ministry is calling out to him. So people come to him and they say, hey, there is this girl called Dorcas. She died. She was sick and she died. Come, Peter. How will you and I feel? What would be your feeling just now you finished and there was a healing in this place now they are saying come fast somebody died huh? okay okay so Nikhil is saying that uh, he'll wait for the prompting of the Holy Spirit if he senses that he's supposed to go he will go fair enough so Peter went. But also, think about their faith. He just gets up and goes. When you hear that somebody is dead, they are calling you to raise the dead. How would you and I react or respond? Where will be our faith? So that I always think of that. If something like that happened, where will our faith be? Can we rise up and go and say, OK, fine, we are coming to pray for resurrection? That was Peter's faith. He went. He went there and he was confident. There were people showing him, oh, look what she made and all. He's not interested. He puts them out. Because just like Jesus, you know, when Jairus' daughter died, Jesus did the same thing. Mark chapter 5, he goes to the house. People are weeping, wailing, crying out and saying, oh, it's so hopeless. This child has died. You know, 12-year-old child has died. Jesus encourages Jairus and he says, do not be afraid, only believe. And he comes to this place again. 
Peter, just like Jesus, he's ministering. He comes here. He's not bothered about all the weeping and crying and showing the garments that Doc has made. He goes ahead and he ministers. He commands her, Talitha, arise, just like Jesus did. So the disciples of Jesus are ministering like Jesus. Okay, And a dead girl comes back to life. So in Sharon and Lydda, do you think faith would have spread? Like faith would have risen among the people? Yeah, of course. Now in Jopa also, because God's power was being manifested city by city, town by town, village by village, region by region. Miracles are happening. Word is being preached. How exciting. Okay, That's how they went about doing the work of God. And uh, Peter is continuing. And Peter now, after the resurrection of this girl, Dorcas, is staying in the home of a man by the name of Simon. Simon the Tanner, it says. Okay. Now, we will read more about what actually happens in Acts chapter 10. And Acts chapter 10 is uh, a passage where there's going to be more missions. Okay, Missions is reaching out to communities of people. Earlier, we have seen cross-cultural missions. Where did we see cross-cultural missions? Is there any place where uh, people ministered outside of their comfort zone? Yeah, where? Did the Jews minister, the Hebrew-speaking Jews minister to any other kind of people? At 6, Hebrew-speaking Jews, Greek-speaking Jews. Okay, so outside of their own community, they are serving people. It happened, right? Now again, outside of the community, so that is missions. There's going to be a shift in the way that people will reach out with the gospel. So we will find in Acts 10 that the gospel will now be taken to the Gentiles for the very first time. First time. Up until that time, nobody was willing to do that. So what is going to happen here? Okay, it's wonderful. We read about a man in Caesarea called as Cornelius. He's a centurion. So that tells us that he was an influential personality with much authority. And he was also a devout man. Okay, So what are some of the things that he did uh, on the basis of his uh, devotion? It says he gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Okay, So God takes notice of our devotion. In this case, Cornelius was a giver. And uh, you know that's encouraging for us when we serve the Lord, uh, by, when we pray, and uh, you know we are giving in the name of the Lord. God did not, so uh, you know, He did not ignore it. Cornelius's devotion was before the Lord. So God sees it, God recognizes it, and that's very encouraging for us. And what God does is God gives Cornelius a vision. So an angel comes and says, Cornelius. Okay. So have we seen things like this happen before? Angel coming and giving direction, guiding us. Yes, no. Any angel earlier came and gave some instruction to anyone? Yeah, give it, give it a try. Don't worry if it's wrong. Philip, you remember? Angel comes to Philip and guides him and tells him, hey, you need to go here. Okay, same way, these are all ways in which God speaks to us. What is happening? Vision. There's a vision. Cornelius is getting a vision. In the vision, angel came and said, Cornelius. Ananias got a vision. And in the vision, God is saying, Ananias, you see, personally, 
God is instructing and guiding people. So that's beautiful and so encouraging for us to see. Cornelius was afraid and he knew it's supernatural. He said, what is it, Lord? Okay, And here is the response which the angel gives him. It says, look, your prayers and your arms or your giving have come up for a memorial before God. So this is also encouraging for us. Whenever we pray, whenever we give, God is taking notice of it. It's come before the Lord. Was it? Was it in vain? No, it was not in vain. So whenever we express our devotion to the Lord by giving to people, by prayer, God is noticing. God noticed about Cornelius so much that he sent an angel to speak to him. And he says, look, it's been noticed and uh, we want you to do something, Cornelius. And what is that? You send men to the house of uh, a man called Simon the Tanner. Because there is somebody who is staying there who is Simon Peter. So you send people over there and, uh, you know, the angel left. Cornelius obeys what the angel told him and sends two of his household servants and a devout soldier. So total three people are going to the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa. Okay. So look, look at this. God wants to do something in Cornelius's life, but God did not explain anything. He only gave him an instruction and said, I want you to send some people to this person's house. Look at, it's beautiful, right? Like Acts, uh, uh, Acts 9, God gave address. Go to the street called as straight. Through the word of knowledge. Okay, we call it word of knowledge. Here also, God is giving address. Go to Joppa. There is a man, Simon the Tanner. Okay, so thank God. Cornelius was just like Philip, obedient man. Cornelius was just like Ananias. See, God is working with these obedient people because he knows if he talks to them, they are going to follow through. So he obeys and, uh, you know, he sends out three people. Now these three people have gone. In the meantime, God is orchestrating something. You remember when God spoke to... Uh, God told Saul, you be in Damascus. Okay. So God told Saul. And God talked to Ananias and said, you go to Saul. He has seen a man in the vision. Ananias coming, healing him. It's like God is making an appointment. He spoke to one man, he spoke to the other man. Now, okay, go. Make it happen. Same thing is happening in Acts 10. God spoke to Cornelius. And what is God doing? He is speaking to Peter also. So Peter, he is up on the housetop. He is praying. It's the sixth hour. Sixth hour is like, uh, sixth hour is like around you know, lunchtime. So he is praying. And uh, Peter is very hungry right now. Okay, And he wants to eat. But at that time, he fell in a trance. Vision is a way that God speaks. Dreams are a way in which God speaks. Trance is also a way in which God speaks. What is trance? Trance is like our body seems lifeless for some time. Like no control on the body. So he just falls. He's not able to move but supernaturally he's seeing things body is weak but supernaturally he is observing okay the message from god so he's in a trance and he gets this vision heaven is opening and there is an object like a great sheet bound at four corners and it is descending to him and it is being let down and what does he see in that sheet there are four footed animals 
of the earth wild beasts uh, there are creeping things birds and then god tells peter rise peter kill and eat okay but peter being the devout jew that he is he knows that he is not supposed to uh, eat certain animals so in the old testament we have laws that forbid the jews from eating certain unclean animals okay, so there is a classification some of those animals were unclean so peter knew all that and that's why he says all the animals are there god how can i eat so he says no lord uh, for i have never eaten anything common or unclean so from that category i have never eaten then the voice spoke to him again the second time what god has cleansed you must not call common this happened three times and the object taken up into heaven again what do you think god was trying to do cornelius got told send people to this man simon what is god talking to simon peter what is all this he's in a he's in a trance he's seeing some animals and god is asking him to eat three times god is saying right don't call what god has called clean cleansed you must not call common what was god trying to say uh it's possible that the distinction was not just between the clean and unclean meat yes. it could also be that the barrier between the jew and gentile had been removed yes because, yes indeed uh, cornelius indeed. yeah yeah nina so you asked to go to congress yeah correct see because we are looking at the the uh, picture and we know what has happened to cornelius so that's why i think we are able to come to the conclusion that there's going to be uh, more missions that will take place and the barrier between the jew and the gentile will be broken but for peter he didn't understand so is it possible that sometimes we see a vision or have a, a dream and we don't understand it yeah it is possible but we can keep praying and asking god to explain it to us that was peter's situation so verse 17 says peter wondered within himself what this vision uh, which he had seen meant so peter did not understand right so he was just clueless and yeah he was in that situation so anything francis you want to ask yeah so now like that that time he was hungry also so it is not mean for like food because that time he is hungry yeah yeah he was hungry so there is a, like might be peter can interpret like okay i is mostly for food maybe it happened right like hey, he can think like that right he could he could he could have thought like that he could have thought that god is god trying to change the laws which were given in the old testament so but clearly luke is writing that peter wondered so we can conclude that he didn't understand the exact meaning of what god was trying to say uh he could have thought that it was about food okay now while he was still thinking what is this what is god trying to say the men who had been sent from cornelius had made enquiry for simon's house and stood before the gate so just now peter had a vision and cornelius's men remember three of them they were already sent by cornelius they are now at simon the tanner's house and they called and asked for peter so this is surprising he is still trying to understand the vision and three men are asking for him what to do what to do now god is doing something but peter is not getting an idea of what god is trying to do so while peter was thinking about the vision he was still thinking what is god trying to communicate holy spirit said to him you see again god is communicating what is he telling behold three men are seeking you arise therefore go down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them 
So one more instruction came. It came before he understood the vision. And thank God Peter was obedient. God is saying, Peter, I know you didn't understand. But now I'm telling you, three people are waiting for you. Just go with them. Don't doubt. Second instruction. Okay. Peter went. And uh, he said, yes, I am Peter. Yes, I am he whom you are looking for. For what reason have you come? So then they tell him, look, we are taking you to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion. He is a just man who fears the Lord. And, uh, you know, uh, an angel came and told him that he should hear words from you. So Peter, please come with us. And so Peter, he goes and a few others also join him from Joppa and he's going to Cornelius's house. So what do we see here? We see that God is orchestrating divine connection, divine appointment, divine ministry. Something is happening in the kingdom of God, which Peter did not fully understand. And yet, thank God for men and women of God who are obedient to the small instructions of God. He still didn't understand the vision. But when he heard the second instruction, you go, Peter, don't doubt anything. He just goes. Okay, so we will stop here and we will find out in the next class how Peter will get an understanding of this unique vision that he had. Okay, so are you finding the book of Acts exciting so far? Yeah, very, very exciting. Every next thing that is going on is full of life, uh, full of God at work. Okay, there are some comments here, but let's pray and we'll close. Uh, can one of the online students go ahead and pray, please? Anyone? Kindly unmute and pray. Shall I pray, Pastor? Yes, yes, Sister. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful learning uh, through this chapter, oh Lord. Thank you, Father, leading us, oh Lord, Jesus, Father, through your words, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us to understand the calling of um, you, oh Lord, whenever Holy Spirit instructs you. Give, gives instructions to us, oh Lord, give us that mind. And so we will understand there should not be any kind of confusion, oh Lord Jesus, Father. Yes, Father, give us the clarity so we will be able to listen to Holy Spirit, oh Lord. Give us that, that kind of heart which you have given to your disciples, oh Lord Jesus, Father, the wisdom you have given to them, oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for all of us, oh Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I commit pastor also into your mighty and Thank you, Father, for her also, Lord Jesus, Father, and all those students who are here, oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Lead us, guide us, and take control over us, oh Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sister Chaya. And thank you, everyone. God bless you. Um, please continue to read the chapters by yourself. Um, I know we are not reading verse by verse in the classes, but uh, take time to read from Acts chapter 1 to chapter 10. Uh, please read and come chapter 10 and also chapter 11 for the next class. Thank you so much. God bless.